Welcome to our live webcast. There's a block for that. The Technique and Benefits of the ESP Block by Dr. Brian Vaughn. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kai Taylor, and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume setting that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A polling window. There's a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the top where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click on the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Ask button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our moderator, Krista Fortenberry, and Dr. Brian Vaughn, Director of Acute Pain Management for the University of Cincinnati, Westchester Medical Campus. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Krista, for opening remarks. Thanks, Kai. Welcome everyone, and thank you for join us, joining us this evening. We're excited to hear from uh, Dr. Brian Vaughn this evening regarding, there's a block for that, the techniques and benefits of ESP blocks. Dr. Vaughn is a board certified anesthesiologist and a fellow of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. He is a graduate of Georgetown University School of Medicine and completed his anesthesia residency at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Vaughn is the Director of Acute Pain Management for the University of Cincinnati Westchester Medical Campus. Thank you all for your engagement and your participation, and please help me in welcoming Dr. Brian Vaughn. Krista, thanks for uh, that introduction. Um, we're going to kind of go through a number of things tonight. Uh, it's sort of a little bit awkward, as everything is with COVID these days, uh, doing this uh, virtually. Uh, but like I say, we'll try and give you the information uh, that you guys want, uh, try and make sure we get to the questions uh, to, to be able to give you the content that you need to effectively uh, do some good for your patients. Um, Erector spine A block is a, is a new block. Um, and it's been around for a couple years. There's a lot of new and developing information about it, even in terms of how it works um, and, and what it can do for patients. So we're gonna kind of run through a number of things fairly quickly here, um, and uh, hopefully uh, this will be good for your patients. Uh, I do have to, I just say for a second, obviously uh, Avenos is sponsoring this uh, event. I am paid for them. Um, and the information, this, uh, this presentation is for educational purposes only. Um, obviously, some of the things that uh, we do that I'll refer to either at the University of Cincinnati uh, or my prior job where I worked running the acute pain service at the Christ Hospital for 15 years uh, may not be in accordance with the directions for use uh, or the packaging label. So, and they may be off label. So, make sure to always refer to the directions for use or the package insert for those. Uh, so we'll sort of divide this, this presentation into two parts. Uh, the first part, we'll, we'll do a little bit of sort of background, what I kind of sort of the soft stuff or philosophical stuff related to acute pain uh, and how we can really do good things for patients. And then the second half of the presentation, we'll really focus in on the erector spinae plane block on how that is a great example of how we can do all of these things for our patients. Um, a little bit of background for myself, just to kind of give you some context. Um, I finished my residency in 2005 uh, and then came to Cincinnati in 2005 at the Christ Hospital, which is sort of the largest private hospital in Cincinnati, one of the largest private practices in the region. Um, and there in about 2006, myself and a couple of my partners started uh, an acute pain service in private practice. I helped to run that for almost 15 years. Uh, I did about 60,000 blocks at the Christ Hospital, about 80,000 practice wide. Uh, did a number of initiatives for quality improvement uh, relative to multimodal, regional, et cetera, to really do a lot of good for patients. And uh, had an opportunity in the last year uh, with the regional fellowship that had been started at the University of Cincinnati and some of the initiatives they were doing there uh, to move over to that and, and bring my expertise there. Um, and, and so this is something uh, that I found works whether you're in private practice or whether you're in academics or whether you're in sort of a hybrid type of a practice as well. Um, so just a little background, you know, we all have heard about the opioid crisis. 
um, it, it keeps getting worse. Um, I started my my career as an orthopedic surgery resident, uh, not as an anesthesia resident. And, and clinic, the idea of clinic kind of forced me out of uh, orthopedics, but the other piece of that was sort of the chronic pain, disability seeking chronic complainer. Um, and so when I think of anesthesia, um, one of the things that I really think about is it sort of used to be, you know, take someone, put them to sleep, wake them up. That's all you needed to do. Um, but really, as more and more research comes out, whether that has to do with uh, patients getting infected because they got cold in the OR, whether that's chronic pain, whether that's perhaps cancer occurrence, more and more research is coming out that really uh, tells us that those choices that we're making in the operating room have really lasting effects on patients much, much further than just uh, what I call the PACU. So it's no longer pre-op, intra-op, PACU, forget you. We've got to remember, you know, that again, after those patients leave PACU, that there's a lot of things that we're doing in the OR that affect them. Um, clearly, um, how much opioid we're giving, what we're doing in terms of whether a patient has really good acute pain control versus not having good uh, pain control really does impact those patients. You can see here uh, it's a lot of statistics here, um, but chronic pain is a huge drain on the health system. Patients who uh, end up with chronic pain, end up on uh, chronic opioid therapy are much more likely to be difficult to take care of in the future. They're more likely to have complications. They're more expensive to take care of. Um, it really does uh, touch a lot of things and just someone being on some pills. Um, there was a recent study that actually came out um, looking at cardiac surgery, and we'll talk about how erector spinase later can really help with cardiac surgery. Uh, but to give you some context here, it doesn't take a lot of opioid to make some more, increase someone's risk of being dependent. So in that study, uh, in that cardiac study, they were looking at uh, post-operative pain and persistent opioid use. And what they figured out was, was that for essentially every 13 Percocet a patient takes, that their risk of being on persistent opioids goes up uh, nearly 20%, it's about 17.5%. Um, 13 Percocet isn't a lot. Um, and so you think that that risk is, is fairly substantial and goes up fairly quickly. So anything we can do uh, for our patients to control their acute pain, to decrease their opioid consumption, and to really limit what their exposure is, is really going to be valuable to those patients, not only for not having pain, but also to uh, prevent this uh, uh, sort of dependence or addiction to opioids. Um, this just sort of gives you some idea of sort of the context. Again, it doesn't sound like a big deal that for sort of general surgical uh, patients, you know, 3% of patients will end up on persistent opioids. Cardiac surgery is even higher. We're talking 8% of patients will end up on persistent opioids. But when you give the context of 3% of all the millions of surgeries that are done, or 8% of the hundreds of thousands of cardiac procedures that are done in the United States every year, there's a tremendous amount of patients uh, that are ending up on their persistent opioids. Um, and like I say, one of the things that made me leave orthopedics was sort of that chronic pain, uh, disability seeking, complaining person. And, and really, we have something to do with that. I mean, there are, there are lots of different studies on different sites of surgery where they're looking at what are the predisposing factors for, let's say, a total knee or a thoracotomy or, or a hernia or a mastectomy that predisposes those patients to, to develop a chronic pain syndrome. Um, and there's lots of different, you know, characteristics that you can use. And they're different for each side of surgery. But the one thing that is common amongst all of those sites of surgery and most important is this concept that if someone has really bad acute pain, they are logarithmically more likely to end up with a chronic pain syndrome. So if we don't take care of patients' acute pain, we are creating these people that are going to have chronic pain. We are creating the people that are going to go on to be dependent on their opioids. So the, the, the converse of that is that if we do a really good job with their acute pain, that those patients are massively less likely to have chronic pain and, and it's significantly less likely to end up on chronic opioids. So all of us, I'm sure, struggle every day with patients who come to the operating room who are on a bunch of opioids preoperatively. And we all know those things are, patients are difficult to take care of. So this is our opportunity to really do something good, not only that day for the patient, but make our lives easier 
months later when those patients come back to the operating room. Um, it really is sort of a sort of a multifaceted problem. I mean, it's not so easy to say acute pain, chronic pain. That's what happens. Uh, you know. Obviously, pain hits a number of systems with the body, whether that's the inflammatory cascade, whether it's sympathetic nervous system, uh, whether that's the uh, adrenocorticoid axis. There's lots of pieces there, um, and so it's not so easy to sort out and research. But clearly, what we can do in that perioperative period is very important. So why don't we just take care of patients' pain with uh, just more narcotics? Um, if you look in sort of any textbook of uh, surgery, medicine, nursing, anesthesia, there's always a few chapters related to all the sort of side effects of, of opioids, um, almost to the point where we literally have become numb to it. Um, I trained at UNC. The, I, they, they, I think the patients there really thought the drug was fiend because they everyone wanted morphine. They didn't want less fiend. Um, but while some of these, these problems kind of, kind of seem, oh, well, if someone has a little itching, no big deal. If someone has a little bit of a constipation, it's no big deal. Um, but these really dramatically, when we get to that a little bit, really impact the amount uh, of money that is being spent within the system and making it difficult to take care of patients. So um, there was a very large study, over 100,000 patients that looked at this and figured out that um, in terms of periprocedural, so that's uh, patients coming to the operating room, but also patients in GI. Of those patients who get narcotics or opioids, 10% of those patients will end up with an opioid-related adverse drug event. And if someone gets one of those adverse drug events, the average cost is over $8,000. Um, so you can see very quickly that those patients, uh, the cost in terms of just the opioid-related adverse drug events is very big. I was looking at the, the University of Cincinnati, and, and they do about 30,000 anesthetics a year. If you look at that and start extrapolating out the data, although the accountants have a hard time finding it. You're looking at a cost to the University of Cincinnati system of over $20 million just in terms of the, 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 the problems associated with opioids, um, not the cost of giving them, the nursing, and all that sort of stuff. And that's where, you know, again, we, these are some of the things that, that people don't talk about even in the textbooks is that, again, the monitoring cost. Like, so if you give opioids, you have to send those patients to the floor, pulse oximetry, and total CO2. They've got that box at the side of the, the bed to monitor that, which is not cheap. You've got to have a, 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 a system to monitor that. So you have to set up telemetry. You have to have, a, have someone monitor telemetry. Uh, you're talking about a pharmacy tech having to fill a Pixis or an Omnicell to, uh, to kind of keep those controlled substances. It takes a nurse on average 12 minutes to give an opioid. So you have to allocate about 20% of a nurse's hourly salary and benefits to the cost of that. So, you know, even aside from just the opioid-related adverse drug events, I mean, the monitoring costs, the staffing costs, the long-term consequences of addiction dependence make it extraordinarily expensive. Um, to be giving opioids and, and sort of bad for patients in terms of outcomes. So when a pharmacist might say, oh, a dose of morphine is $1.50, um, they're really just talking about acquisition costs. They're not talking about like the life cycle cost of what it really truly costs to give that medication. So, um, you know, hospitals historically have been bad about properly allocating costs and figuring out where all that goes. Um, and so when you look at sort of setting up acute pain services, it seems expensive. You got nurses, you got block trays, you got local anesthetic, you've got pumps, you've got all of these things that show up very clearly in those accounting statements, but all the benefits, they're there. They're very clearly there. When I was at Christ Hospital, we were spending about $2 million a year on the acute pain service, um, but they were probably making five to $8 million on the backside in terms of decreased opioid-related adverse drug events, decreased um, length of stay, increased uh, throughput, and increased procedures that were being done. Uh, but those are really hard to find, and you have to be able to lead people through that. Um, so why, why do we use catheters? Why do I run a, a, a catheter-based program at, uh, at Christ Hospital? Why do we continue to do catheters at the University of Cincinnati? It, it's because they allow you to do the exact right thing for the patient. Um, and whether that's making it last longer, whether that's you know, if someone's having pain, you can sort of reinforce it with a bolus. Uh, if someone needs uh, needs to have it 
stop for whatever reason, physical therapy, patients going home, you can pull it out when you ever need it. Um, and it's really well studied to do the right thing for the patient. And what, what you do see when you look at the literature um, is that really you need 48 to 72 hours of really good analgesia to, to change outcomes for patients. So just doing a single injection block um, or a block with long acting, quote unquote, local anesthetic um, that may last 18, 24 hours, even with some additives, maybe a little longer than that. Um, really, those are the things that don't really change outcomes. Patients get rebound pain. They end up, you know, end up taking a lot, a lot of narcotics that they would have anyway. Uh, but to really to change the outcomes, if patients have pain months later, if patients are on their opioids later, if patients are getting discharged from the hospital later, uh, you really need that 48 to 72 hours or longer that the catheters provide. Um, so with that as background, we'll sort of go go on and sort of look at how rector uh, spin spinary plane block um, really uh, does a lot of good for patients and, and may be a way for you to add this to your practice or or expand this within your practice um, to to do good for your patients. Um, the, the the nice thing about this is that it's a much more superficial block for those who have been doing paravertebrals or those who have looked at doing paravertebrals but didn't feel comfortable. Um, you know, basically you're doing this much more superficial and, and what that allows you to do uh, is, is to see the anatomy very easily. It allows you to see your needle much more easily because it's not sliding the block in between two transverse processes, a steep angle and making it hard to see. You don't have the lung sitting right there as a backstop uh, that you're very wary of. So um, the anatomy is very simple. You basically have uh, your paraspinous muscles superficial. Uh, you got your transverse process um, there, and that's what you're going to use uh, for your landmarks. Uh, so again, hopefully you can see my pointer on the screen. So again, you've got your paraspinous muscles, your rector spinae is your deepest muscle there. Uh, it sits on top of the inner transverse ligament that con connects your transverse processes. And what you're trying to do is get your local anesthetic to lay uh, and distribute in that plane uh, between uh, the uh, deep fascia of the uh, erector spinae muscle and the uh, inner transverse ligament there, uh, that potential space. So again, if you look over here, what you're trying to do is get your needle here and get that local to spread. Um, but again, because you're superficial, especially superficial at the bones, it makes the uh, ultrasound acquisition much simpler. Um, in terms of how this works, there's some controversy in literature. Some of the early data suggested this was sort of a superficial paravertebral block and the local just sort of soaks down uh, and eventually gets to the paravertebral space. But uh, more um, recent data and larger studies have suggested that probably actually uh, it is more affected by spreading laterally uh, than, than getting deep. And so when we look at this as a comparison to paravertebral, um, we're going to have to probably do some more studies to see if the mechanism of action is different. Um, is is the are or say are the long term benefits of erector spinae going to be similar to paravertebral? Um, and certainly that is an interesting question that remains to be answered. Uh, but very clearly, if patients aren't getting anything, whether it's an epidural or a paravertebral, moving the ball forward by using rector spinae blocks um, will definitely get them better uh, pain control acutely uh, and perhaps other benefits as well. Um, so again, to make this really simple, so these are ultrasound still captures of us doing blocks. Um, so if you look at the left-handed panel pre-injection, you're going to get an image very similar to your pair of if you're used to doing those. Um, so again, you're looking at your transverse processes. Uh, again, it's a parasagittal image. You see your inner transverse ligament here, the erector spine is sitting on top of that. Deep, you may see the paravertebral space and then the pleura below that. Again, to do this block, if you look on the right-hand side, you don't need to see the paravertebral space, but it's good to know where it is uh, to make sure you're not too lateral. Um, and what you're really looking to do, as with any plane block, is getting a very clear deposition of local anesthetic in the plane between the two fascial planes. Um, if you end up sort of getting your injection more in the muscle here or down here, you're really going to limit your spread of local anesthetic, which limits um, how many segments you can block. Um, also, by disrupting the mo motor fiber or the muscle fibers um, and getting more absorption uh, into those disrupted fibers, you're probably putting yourself at the higher risk for uh, local anesthetic toxins as well. So although plain blocks, whether it's fascia iliaca, tap block, paravertebral rector spinae, they are very simple, 
uh, in the fact that uh, you don't have to put a catheter right next to a nerve, uh, which can be difficult at times, uh, but you still have to be very precise in getting in that right plane is super important. Uh, again, depending on what level you're doing these at for various surgical procedures, uh, the exact uh, layers of muscle uh, that you see above uh, the, uh, the, the transverse process may be slightly different. Um, as we sort of referred to earlier when I was talking about this, uh, and sort of all those insidious aspects of pain. I mean, pain hits so many different body systems. Um, really, by letting patients have uncontrolled pain, you're really putting them at risk for uh, in complications in a number of different areas, even separate from the chronic pain issue. So, again, all of these uh, possible ways that the, the pain affects the body in a negative fashion. Uh, and what we're looking to do with regional anesthesia is to really mitigate those. And, and it's not, I don't want to tell people that, you know, it's just about local anesthetic and doing nerve blocks. So it's clearly not. I and mean, this is a holistic process, and, and pain is created in a lot of different ways. So um, the regional does a great job for those incisional pain, whether that's uh, uh, cutaneous or visceral. Uh, it doesn't do a great job with muscle spasm, perhaps, unless you're blocking motor nerves. doesn't necessarily uh, deal with nerve-mediated pain. Uh, so although we're talking specifically about a block today and in general regional, uh, it's important to remember uh, to really take that holistic approach to the patient, get the multimodal in, uh, whether that's giving an NSAID, whether that's giving sort of a gabapentinoid, uh, whether that's giving things like dex dexamethasone or using ketamine or other medicines to treat those other sources of pain or, or how pain is produced or transmitted are super important. So it, I always tell people the multimodal makes an okay block good, a good block great, and a great block perfect. Um, so want to remember that as we go forward with these. Um, there's been uh, sort of, since, since they were first described in 2016, there's been a number of case reports for a whole bunch of different surgeries. Um, basically, your erector spinae uh, block is going to cover territories very similar to, to paravertebral wood. So uh, it, its most common uses are breast surgery, uh, thoracic surgery, rib fractures. You can use it for abdominal procedure, although other uh, blocks may be better or easier to perform uh, from a technical standpoint, not having to sit patients up or roll them side to side to get to the rectus spinae block. Um, but but it, is, it is very good for those. It, it also, uh, when you get further down in terms of the low thoracic or, or lumbar area, uh, it does become a bit of a deeper block, a little harder to do, but you know, certainly uh, it's most described and best researched in, a, in the thoracic area. We touched on these a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, for those people who never have felt comfortable for paravertebral, this is clearly a simpler and shallower block to perform. It's much easier to acquire the ultrasound image that you need. It's much easier to follow uh, your, your needle in planks. You can take a much shallower approach, much less likely to have complications. Um, so we touched on this earlier, and you know, again, there's a little controversy on, on exactly how this works. It remains to, to be definitively uh, uh, researched. All that means is, you know, again, if someone is not getting a block, giving them good acute pain is very clearly going to, to give them benefits. In very specific instances, um, perhaps long-term pain after breast cancer, for example, if you're already doing paravertebral blocks, um, and there is good data there suggesting reduction in post mastectomy pain syndrome, we might need to wait until uh, those patients, uh, we, we see some research for erector spine that gives us the same benefit. So I might not switch someone who's already getting a paravertebral block to an erector spine block. Um, but very clearly, if not, someone's not getting a block, let's say for a mastectomy or not getting a block for a thoracotomy, uh, we certainly don't need to wait uh, uh, for, for definitive long-term data on these to really move forward. All right, so how do we get there? Uh, again, it's very critical. We'll show some uh, ultrasound videos here shortly uh, that show exactly where you need to be. And I think a lot of people, when I've been talking to them, have sort of gotten some inconsistent results. And the theme I hear from those people is that 
the, the precision necessary really hasn't been explained to them. Um, you know, a lot of people have heard for an erector spinal block, just go to the transverse process, hit the transverse process, and inject and just watch the local spread. And, and although that works many times, uh, you're making sure that you get the exact right spread and what I call the lift uh, of, of the erector spinal muscle clearly up. And that quick, look, quick spread off both sides of the ultrasound screen in the uh, cranial caudad direction uh, is really important to making sure this works consistently and well. So again, what, what we're talking about in these images, you want to see the rectus spine actually lift up, but then also this local anesthetic should spread off both sides of the screen very quickly. If you have very kind of so, slow spread or you see that muscle splaying, um, you're going to want to stop and you're going to want to either advance or withdraw your needle to try to get in that plane. And, and one thing that's, that's helpful if you have someone injecting from you is, is as you are moving that needle, having that person continue to inject and sort of pressurize the syringe in the needle will allow that, that injection to find that plane of least resistance, which should be the ESP plane, um, and, and to find that. So again, if your initial injection, you see kind of spreading the muscle here too high, if you see it kind of going down between the transverse processes too low, and we really want to get that spread here uh, right on top of that layer in the right plane. So if we look at this first video, uh, what we're going to see is that initial spread is a little bit too high in the muscle here, in the erector spine. Uh, and then, then we're going to readjust the needle, kind of slide down the transverse process here to make sure we're in that right plane. And you'll see very clearly how you see that lift and spread. So we'll go ahead and start that now. Again, we, we mostly do these patients sitting because it's easy to do bilateral blocks that way. Uh, you can do them prone. You can do them lateral if you want. Uh, again, you see the needle coming in from the right side of the screen. You see contact in the transverse process. Um, and then you see, I'll pause there. Just let me go back to that here. And what you see right there is you see that injection. You see a little bit of lift, but what you don't see is that local going off both sides of the screen, you kind of see that muscle separating there. Okay, so what we'll see if we let it play further is a readjustment of that needle, slide down the transverse process to advance because we're too high. And then the second injection, what you'll see very clearly is that clear delineation of space, the muscle lifting up and that local going very quickly off both sides of the screen uh, and very clearly defining that erector spinae plane that we're trying to get into. Uh, this is the opposite of that, this, this first injection. Uh, what we'll see actually the first couple injections will actually spread down into the space between the transverse process and then slow withdraw of the needle, we'll get it to eventually find that right plane. So we'll go ahead and play that now. And get needle coming in from the right hand side, which we're sitting, so this is a uh, caudal to cranial. Again, going towards the apex of that transverse process. Um, and then what we'll see, watch that first injection, you'll see a little bit of lift, but what you'll also see is the local sort of see spreading here and down between the muscles. You see a little lift there, but again, you see that local spreading here, so we'll sort of withdraw our needle again. Again, that local is in between the transverse process, and then sort of the third time being the charm as we bring back that needle a little bit. Again, then you start seeing that very clear lift here and spread off both sides of the, uh, the screen very quickly. And that's really critical to get these to work well, to get your good spread, uh, which gives you sort of your vertical anesthesia. So what I tell people is based on the research, you'll get four to six, maybe a little more dermatomes. The one thing to remember with this is that the erector spinae, as opposed to paravertebral and epidural, it spreads easier cephalad than caudad. So Epidural is the opposite, paravertebral is the opposite. It usually spreads caudad a little bit better. So when you're doing erector spinae blocks, you're going to want to be a little lower than traditionally you have been for either doing an epidural or paravertebral. So for the cardiac cases, we're at T5, which if you think about the innervation of the sternum seems a bit low, but it's because, again, you get more vertical spread uh, you know, towards the head than you do towards the bottom. Uh, that you want to be there. Otherwise, you'll end up missing the inferior aspect of the sternum and the chest tubes, perhaps. Um, potential complications and contraindications. Again, it's a very superficial block, uh, much less likely to have uh, complications. You know, if you lose track of exactly where your needle is, you can sort of pass point. Um, but it is uh, seemingly a very, very uh, low-risk block. 
contraindications are essentially very similar to sort of any regional anesthetic, patient refusal, uh, whether the person has an allergy, infection, side, et cetera. Uh, but again, part of the benefit of the rectal spinae block being a superficial block is that you're, you're, you're not having to worry about things or worry as much about things like anticoagulation like you would for an epidural or a paracetamol, which allows you to reach patient populations like the cardiac surgery population that you couldn't previously with just epidural and paravertebral. Um, we always want to sort of be evidence-based. Um, you know, Ferrero first described this in 2016. Uh, for, the, for the next couple of years, really a lot of the data was interesting, but not very scientific. A lot of case reports, small case series. Hey, I, I did this block and it seemed to work well. Um, and, and so I, we sort of held off a little bit, initially sort of jumping on the bandwagon because we were doing a lot of paravertebral blocks. Um, but then sort of towards the end of 2018, early 2019, we started seeing some more rigorous data being produced, uh, especially in the cardiac surgery population. There were three studies that came out, all of which um, showed uh, very good efficacy uh, for the cardiac surgery population. Some of these um, were randomized, some of them were re retrospective, uh, but all of them seemed to, to say, show the same thing. This is a very good block for this population. Uh, and you can imagine, uh, given the pain associated with sternotomy, if you could cover the sternotomy with this block, you should be able to do a lot with other thoracic cases. So um, this was uh, a study done, and they, they just did single injections versus sort of their traditional pathway. Uh, it was prospective, which was nice. They did, did show things like early extubation, uh, but you know, they, they very quickly saw their, uh, the benefits sort of wane uh, afterwards. Um, this was uh, this was a really nice uh, study done uh, that came out uh, very shortly afterwards. They used continuous block for 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 the erector spinae claim block for for these cardiac patients. Uh, again, historical control, but prospectively done, and, and they saw you know significantly decreased narcotic, like they did with single injection, decreased post on narcotic use. Um, but the interesting thing here is we referred to earlier about getting that 48, 72 hours of analgesia was they were actually able to uh, demonstrate decreased pain out of the month. Um, so what did we see? And I know some of the people have heard that. Uh, so I, we, we, one of the last things I did before I left Christ Hospital was do a quality improvement project in cardiac, initiating the erector spinae plane block based on the data we were seeing uh, of those, uh, those early studies. Um, we took patients who were either ha outpatients having primary cabbage, aortic valve, aortic root surgery. Uh, didn't change anything else, just started doing retrospinal plane blocks. Uh, that paper has just been accepted by the European Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons annual meeting. The paper has also been accepted. And so I can't talk specifically about that because it hasn't been presented yet, but the, but the results are fairly dramatic and sort of eye-popping. But what I can share you is, again, this is one of our early patients that we saw um, you know, and this is, you know, we were sort of very cautious about the amount of narcotic we were giving because we didn't want to short change patients, but um, very little narcotic usage, uh, patients doing very well. Um, you know, again, if I had a post-op heart, I, I, if I made up numbers, I'm sure they probably wouldn't look this good. Um, and, and this patient, like I say, you know, came to the ICU talking, uh, very lucid, almost like he had a gallbladder. And did really well. I mean, the main problem that we had with sort of this uh, this process improvement pro process was that the nurses weren't really in the ICU quite ready to talk to their patients on arrival. Uh, you know, they have a really super long list of uh, things to get done in terms of uh, you know checking chest tubes, getting monitors up, you know checking checking blood gases, etc. That you know having a patient who's basically awake and talking uh, is sometimes a little hard to deal with. We had to do some things to help them, but. Uh, you know, this is sort of sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of what this study will show. Um, patients did extraordinarily well, uh, and uh, we will have the data sort of to be able to distribute for you uh, in, the, uh, in the early fall here. Um, so things that still need to be figured out with rectal spinae plane block, um, you know, exactly how does it work? Maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't. Um, which surgeries is it really effective? Um, What's the best infusion rates? Are we doing infusions? Do we need to do intermittent boluses? Um, you know, a plain blocks, 
you know, that are, that are large spaces with dilute local anesthetic, you know, in, in theory, maybe, maybe PIB works there. Um, how do we, uh, how do we best get these to work for, you know, 24, 48, you know, 72 or even longer hours after the surgery? Is it the, is it the infusion? Is it the bolus? Um, how does it compare? Is it cost effective? Uh, so a number of questions remain. The early uh, results certainly are very favorable for extraspinal block. Uh, so this is sort of a summary of, of it. It's a super easy block to do. You can do a lot of really good things for patients. You have to be precise about placing it, um, but it's certainly worthwhile adding to sort of your, uh, your repertoire of what you can do for patients to make them have better outcomes. And that's really sort of, sort of at the end here to, to sum up, you know, what, what I find I'm trying to do, and I, and I think what a lot of people are trying to do is get the best outcomes for the patients in a way that's sustainable in terms of costs. And, and using continuous blocks is, is certainly a way to do that. You can get patients doing better. And, and again, like, you know, again, it, when you look at the cardiac data if if you look at you know adding five or six hundred dollars of a continuous nerve block the patients extubate earlier patients have less pain in a month or uh, other positive benefits those, those five to six hundred dollars of of placement costs are, are very quickly recouped uh, by the system um, and basically what we're trying to do is get these patients to to do really well um, and get them back to sort of what their normal functional status would be. Um, and I think at this point, we're pretty much done. Um, if people have questions, I think those should have been rooted through Krista and Kai, and maybe we'll kind of leave, uh, we got about 20 minutes or so um, to, to take those and try, and I'll try and answer those as best as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Bond. We actually do have some questions. Kind of going off of, um, we know that the ESP block will cover many, many different types of surgeries from cardiac surgery, mastectomies. Kind of going to the mastectomy realm for just a minute. Have you seen any issues with nerve monitoring during an axillary dissection? Um, I, I would say, you know, our, the surgeons that I dealt with have not voiced that concern. That being said, I'm not sure how much nerve monitoring they're doing. Um, it's not like a spine where they have these, you know, big neuromonitoring stations set up. Um, we haven't had any problems. And we were doing paravertebrals for a lot of those cases as well. Um, and neither one of those, uh, none of our, our breast surgeons were advocating for more of the blocks, not less of the blocks. So they never mentioned anything, but I didn't specifically ask either. Great question. Also regarding mastectomies and, and breast surgery, um, how does the ESP block compare to PEC one and two for breasts? In your in your thought processes. Right. Never having breast surgery myself, I don't know specifically. Um, there, 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 it's a hard question to answer. Um, there was one small study uh, where PECs and, and erector spine and just kind of single injections were compared. Um, the problem is that, you know, PEX is basically a single injection technique. If you re read the original studies by Dr. Blanco, he even said in his studies, it only lasts about six to eight hours for PEX. And he actually put catheters in for PEX blocks and his surgeons operated around them. Um, he must have had really nice surgeons because I can't imagine the surgeon operating around my nerve block catheter. Um, but, but that's the main issue is that, you know, if you look at uh, all sorts of different sites of surgery, whether it's knees, whether it's shoulders, whether it's tap blocks, uh, whether it's paravertebral blocks from mastectomies, um, in order to change long-term outcomes, whether patients are going home sooner or they have decreased long-term pain, all of those studies show that you need to get 48, 72 hours or more, much longer than a single injection can provide to get those positive changes in outcomes. So my concern about PECs is twofold. One, some of the surgeons have complained that di their dissection planes are somewhat messed up by PEX block when we're doing that preoperatively. And it's hard to do PEX blocks post-op because the bandages are there. But the second concern of mine is you really can't place catheters for that. And so I, I really think 
patients benefit from that catheter. So we, for mastectomies at Christ, have stuck to paravertebrals for mastectomies because there's good long-term data, not just about acute pain, but chronic pain. Um, and we use rector spinase for like the deep flaps um, uh, or other breast surgeries that aren't mastectomies um, because previously we didn't do anything for them. So we are really moving uh, away from PEX and towards erector spinae uh, for those. But again, the, the sort of definitive studies comparing PEX versus erector spinae still need to be done. Great, thanks so much. We're gonna move down the body just a little bit and head towards, uh, let's head towards cardiac. So with cardiac, uh, will the block, have you seen that the block shows quicker extubation on these patients? Um, I think there's a number of studies that have shown that if you look at, uh, you know, the McCary study and the Krishna study, um, again, we can, we can get these studies to people that are interested if they want to want to look at the data themselves. Um, but yeah, no, the cardiac patients are definitely extubating sooner, um, with the erector spinae blocks, um, than they did without them. Now, the question for that is, is that due to, decreased narcotics? Is that due to the retrospinae providing better analgesia or a combination of both or some other factor? Um, but certainly the data uh, that we're seeing uh, from a number of different studies is showing earlier extubation and other positive downstream consequences from that. All right. Uh, any, anticoag any anticoagulation issues that you've seen? Uh, we have not. Um, again, we are pretty aggressive about blocks. Uh, at Christ, uh, before I left, you know, they had asked us to do, one of the surgeons had come uh, and, and asked us to do paravertebral for those mini, minimally invasive mitral valves. Um, and we did some single injections, but I really wasn't sure how much that was really helping the patients. And we weren't really excited about doing catheters in the paravertebral space in the face of full anticoagulation for bypass. Uh, so that kind of went by the wayside. Um, erector spinae being superficial seems to be very low risk. I mean, certainly you can get a hematoma, but again, if you get a hematoma, uh, you're unlikely to cause any problems that are serious. I mean, yes, you might have to, um, do a washout or release the hematoma. Um, but again, you're not gonna get pressure on the spinal cord or cause other problems. And that's what made us comfortable to do these for cardiac surgery. Um, we specifically have not seen any problems. The, the, the data from the three studies where they, other studies where they looked at this for cardiac surgery did not show any problems with bleeding hematoma or other adverse events. So it seems to be a very safe block uh, especially in the population of patients who are anticoagulators. Great. So can you kind of give us a little bit of your experience with other thoracic procedures? And also, um, do, do the different procedures, cardiac and thoracic, seem to have any, do any of the procedures seem to have a greater uh, pain relief benefit than others? Um, so... Uh, I'll answer that sort of in two parts. So we had moved away from epidurals at, at Christ, uh, mainly at surgeon requests because of either failed placement or fiddle factor dealing with hypotension, like weakness, uh, worry about anticoagulation, et cetera. So for those patients who are appropriate, we were doing either tap blocks or paravertebrals for a, for a large segment of those populations to get really good pain control. Um, so we had almost exclusively done paravertebrals for, for thoracic cases and they got great analgesia. Um, because there's some good data suggesting decreased chronic pain uh, incidents uh, with the paravertebral block, we sort of stuck with that 
uh, and continue to give paravertebrals to those patients. Um, what I tell people is, so when we started TAP at Christ Hospital, we've done over 16,000 TAP blocks there. Um, we started early before there was a ton of evidence that, uh, that TAP blocks really did a good job. Um, but at that point, those patients were only getting PCAs. So we were taking, you know, we were, we were an early adopter. The evidence wasn't developed yet, but what we figured was it's a very low risk procedure, a TAP block. And those patients are only getting PCAs right now. So we're, we're likely to do something good for them and unlikely to do harm to them. Now, with the thoracic patients, since we were doing paravertebral, we felt we didn't want to move to rector spine A block because there was really good data that did a, paravertebrals did a really good job for thoracic surgery. However, in other situations where no one's getting epidurals or no one's getting paravertebral for thoracic cases, I would urge people to do erector spinase for those because, again, giving patients something, even if the data is early in those, is better than nothing. Um, and as I moved across to the University of Cincinnati, and where it's a, a very robust trauma service, and seeing the benefits the director of spine A can provide to patients sort of anecdotal, and really we need to do a study for rib fractures um, in saving patients from getting intubated and coming to other bad events. I, I would suppose that it is a very effective procedure for thoracic cases. Um, it just depends on sort of where you are in the continuum of your block program. So if you're doing paravertebrals, I would, I would suggest maybe staying with paravertebral. Uh, but if you're doing nothing, I would urge you to do erector spinings for those patients to get them good analgesia. Great. We're going to move up the body, back up the body just a little bit. How would you approach um, using this block for minimally invasive esoph esophagectomies? Um, would, it, would it work? I uh, haven't done many of those. Um, I guess the question is you're going to have to figure out where, where they're at in terms of the level of incision. So um, when we're doing the deep flaps, we're mainly trying to cover the abdomen and might get some of the breasts for a T10. Uh, when we're doing the cardiac um, ones, we're at T5. So depending on where your incision is, you're just gonna wanna err on the side of being a little lower. I guess my question would be, what are you doing for those? You know, maybe we have to have a follow-up call separately for whoever answer that question. But the question is, what are you doing now? What are you trying to cover? Um, are there, is there one incision or are you doing multiple incisions and exactly how the procedure is going to figure out exactly where you would need to put your erector spinae block uh, to sort of give as much analgesia as you can. You know, again, you know, in some of these complicated procedures like uh, abdominal perineal resection where you have two different incisions, one in the abdomen, one in the perineum, or some of these complicated uh, cancer surgeries like, like uh, of the esophagus, you may have multiple incisions and you may have to make certain decisions on, are you putting two catheters in at different levels? Are you doing left catheters and right catheters? Or, or are you doing left catheters high and low? Um, some of these can be sort of complicated ideas, but uh, maybe that's something we can follow up with later. Perfect. So tell me a little bit about your thought process on intermittent large boluses um, over, say, like Q3 hours. Um, does it seem to work better than a consistent infusion or after the initial bolus? Or do you feel like a, the, it's a better for a consistent run? I don't have any scientific answer for that. I mean, I think the theory... Uh, of a plain block and a bolus seems to make sense. Um, the problem is no one has really ever done a good study. And Dr. Buddy, who runs the uh, regional fellowship at the University of Cincinnati and sort of my compatriot downtown and I'm up at the Northern Center. Uh, we've talked about this a lot you know, in terms of really defining is an intermittent bolus, like how, how would it work? What's the mechanism? And the real problem is we don't know what the drain is. And what I mean by that is if you think about your house and, your, and, and your, your child running the bathtub, it really doesn't matter, you know, if they're going to flood the house, how much they're putting into the tub, as long as the drain is taking it off out of the tub. So the question is, you know, what is the drain of these blocks? So in order for them to continue to work, we need to be at least putting in as much local anesthetic as is being drained out. 
and the question is, so if the, if the body is only absorbing two or three uh, milliliters an hour, then having a constant infusion of four or five is plenty. Um, but, but again, if the drain is large, it's taking out 10 or 20 an hour, then rebolusing with a large volume of local anesthetic to refill that area makes complete sense. And then you rely on that, on the longer acting half-life of, of a drug like bupivacaine or ropivacaine to cover the duration between the boluses. I mean, it makes sense. If we can give a single injection erector spinae block with half percent ropivacaine, and that's going to last 12 hours, then we should be able to bolus every three or four with a volume. The main problem is, you know, what is a safe bolus in terms of concentration and volume that we can essentially give unmonitored uh, on an every so often basis? And again, that's, that's certainly research that uh, Dr. Buddy and I have talked about doing. We haven't figured out how to do it. Um, I'm sure there's other people who are smarter than me already working on the problem, but uh, that, is, that is very clearly something that needs to be looked at, especially for plain blocks. I think the rationale for boluses is, is less for, you know, if you think about it, uh, for the rationale or the scientific mechanism, you know, again, it, probably less necessary for, for peripheral nerve blocks, but certainly the, the mechanism would seem to be something that would work with the plain blocks, but not, not really been defined yet. So if you're doing single shot injections bilaterally, what do you recommend as a local anesthetic volumes uh, surgeries for something like a lap coli? Um, and what, what do you look at at your max volume? Would you, would you say for that? Yeah, so I, I try to do catheters, I guess is the answer. But, um, you, you know, it's really a weight-based in, in, a, in, in a comorbidities problem. So if someone's over, you know, 60-ish kilograms, um, I'm very – and no risk for local anesthetic toxicity, like a low-protein state, liver failure, cardiac failure, other issues. Uh, I'm very comfortable giving, giving a, up to 60 mLs of half percent ropivacaine, you know, whether that's for tap blocks, uh, whether that's rector spinae blocks, if you're doing a bilateral block. I mean, if you're doing unilateral block, you don't need that much. But, um, you know, once you get below, you know, 60 to 70 kilograms, I still like the volume. Plain blocks are definitely volume driven blocks. You've got to get the volume in there to get your spread. Um, and you need to figure out what milligram dose of local anesthetic is appropriate, but you've got to give the volume. So, uh, if they start getting uh, like thin, I know we don't see a lot of thin patients, but if they're, you know, 50 kilograms, then you're going to, you know, cut your local anesthetic concentration to 0.33 or 0.25. Uh, and, but you still want to be giving that 30 mLs aside or at least 20 mLs aside uh, to really get that spread. I mean, the spread, which is volume driven, is really what gives your craniocondyl spread for tap blocks, for paravertebral blocks, for rector spinae blocks. So you really got to preserve your volume and then adjust the concentration to give the appropriate num number of milligrams. Great. What, your tip, what is your typical infusion rate and what, what local are you currently utilizing? Uh, yeah, we use 0.2% ropivacaine. Um, you know, again, I think for non-lower extremity blocks, it's, it's probably fine to use bupivacaine for infusions. Uh, it's just that our pharmacy just likes to use pretty much just one thing. Um, and so, so I do like the safety factor of, of bolusing with ropivacaine. Um, so, so basically, uh, once we bolus these catheters, uh, the bolus will last you know, 12 hours-ish. Um, and, and typically what we did uh, with the cardiac project at Christ was we just sent them the unit yeah, you know, four or five mLs an hour on each side. And then as that bolus wanes, the nurses could turn those up to a maximum of seven per side or 14 mLs total per hour uh, as the patient needed. Great. Uh, yes, yes or no? ESP block for anterior total hips, yes or no? Can I make sure I don't effective? know? I don't know. I typically use fasciolaca blocks for those. There are some people who have started looking at that. I, I don't know the answer, I guess, is the question, is the answer. 
I'll take C, none of the above. C, none of the above. How about for vats? Have you been placing Va catheters for vats? Oh yeah, I mean, pretty much for all the thoracic patients. Um, so we mainly did paravertebrals, but if we had problems getting into the paravertebral space, we would do erector spinae blocks for those. Um, you know, again, for the cardiac patients, thoracic patients, all these patients get catheters, uh, breast, breast surgery, whatever. Um, you know, if you're getting into that plane, I mean, a catheter is actually easier to place in some levels than a single injection because the needle you're using to place it is bigger and easier to see. And all you're doing is doing your bolus and then just pushing a catheter in. So, yeah, no, it, it, you know, we've done a ton for, for rib fractures. It seems to work really well. We're looking at doing a study there. Um, and, and for the patients who we couldn't do a paravertebral for a thoracic case, and need, needed to quote unquote bail out with a uh, erector spinae or for the mastectomy patients uh, where we'd like to do a paravertebral and bail out with erector spinae, they seem to get very good analgesia. But I, I haven't done the study to prove that. Um, when you're doing an ASP catheter, about how far into the plane do you normally insert the catheter and any, any kind of tips and tricks for not having the catheter fail? Um, yeah, I would just push it in three to five centimeters past the needle. Um, what we typically do is just, uh, for a plain block, I typically bolus all my local anesthetic except five mLs to really open up the space because it's just easier to inject through the needle, thread the catheter three to five centimeters past the needle tip, take, the, take it out, connect the catheter, and inject the last five mLs through the catheter just to make sure all those connections are working and there's not a leak or um, the catheter's kinked for some reason why the infusion isn't going to work later. Great. Lumbar surgery. How are we looking for, for spinal fusions or um, any kind of full, full scoli cases, anything like that for ESP? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I know there's some people out there doing it. Um, they probably have more tolerant spine surgeons than uh, I worked with in terms of putting local anesthetic right next to where they're working. Um, you know, certainly there's some people out there and there's been a, a, a few case reports or small studies that suggested it's effective. Um, I'm thinking probably pectus excavatum surgery is probably a really good place for it. Uh, I'm not sure about all those kids with scoli, uh, but, but again, that, that sort of remains determined. I mean, again, this block has only essentially existed um, for about four years. So there's a lot of, lot of things to still define about exactly how best it can be used. Great. I, I do have a couple of different questions kind of coming into regarding using the catheter over needle, over the needle. You, you utilize placing your, your catheter through the needle, correct? Uh, yeah, for, for the vast majority. I mean, it, for this, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think a catheter over the needle is tough in the paravertebral space um, because the main difference between an over the needle or a through the needle device is, is that, that you, you really have to pass point just a little bit with those over the needle devices to get the catheter to sit in the right place so it doesn't thread through the tissue or over the needle. Um, and in that paravertebral space, in order to get that catheter, sometimes in the paravertebral space, you actually have your needle almost into the pleura um, before your catheter would be far enough into the space. But for the director spine, because you can take a much more shallower trajectory, um, you certainly can do it. Um, one of the challenges, though, is um, you know you have that hard fixed hub and with an over the needle device, it's only, it's fixed by the length of your needle. So if you're doing a thoracic erector spinae block, you're gonna have a difficult time maybe getting it up to the shoulder or around the side of the patient so they're not laying on that hard catheter. Whereas with a through the needle catheter, you've got that 30 centimeters or so to move that connect, hard connector device uh, that goes to the lure lock. Uh, sort of up to the shoulder around to the side of the patient so they're not laying on that and sort of what I call the princess in the pee phenomenon uh, where they're sort of annoyed by that thing sitting on their back because a lot of these patients who are getting these blocks are having anterior surgery so they're going to be trying to sleep or be comfortable uh, supine uh, and if they have that hard hub in between their shoulder blades that can be a dissatisfier. 
Great. Kind of going now to one last question I have, and it's kind of a generalized question for you. Uh, can you provide any additional information regarding what outcomes you measured in your quality improvement project? So I will tell you this. We looked at opioid consumption. We looked at time to extubation. We looked at length of stay in the ICU and length of stay over their entire hospitalization as the sort of the four primary things and all sort of have to leave you hanging on what the results are until they're presented. But um, those four things were pretty cool to see. Great. Well, that, that's pretty much all the questions that we have. Okay. Well, thank, thank you everyone for your time. I, you know, I know it's uh, hard to take time away from everyone's families, especially sort of around dinner time, depending on what time zone you're in. So thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm sure your local uh, territory managers, uh, if you have further questions or, or need clarifications on things, can, uh, can get a hold of me if they need to. On behalf of Avenos Acute Pain, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. A post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Please take a moment to complete this survey as it will help Avenos plan future web events. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.